and welcome into episode 50. Yes, the big 5-0 of Hoops Across the Mountain State. Yes, I am Taylor Kennedy, and I am back for yet another episode of this podcast. And it is also the one-year anniversary as well of the podcast. Whenever this gets aired on July 9th will be our one-year anniversary as well for episode 50 of Hoops Across the Mountain State. I am joined in studio. Yes, in studio. We are no longer doing Zoom. Just kidding, just for this one episode, we are. But anyways, we are in studio with Tony, well, no, I should say Baloney Caridi and Brad Howe. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing today? What did he call you? He took a shot right off Why, the why does he want to take a shot well, right you off see, the bat? He took a shot on the introduction of the <laughs> I, guest. I was surprised by that. I, I was didn't gonna, see that coming. I was going to play it like, okay, I'm going to be very nice. Until just, at least 20 minutes in. Yeah, I wasn't going to, and he starts off with that. Okay. Well, We're I mean, good. You, you, no, no, the table's been set. We're fine. No, I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, we've gone over Tyler, Tanner. I don't think anybody in this building oh, knows I who see my what name you're is. doing. I mean, because yeah. I mess your name up. Yeah. I got you. Chrissy even came in and said the other day, because I told him about this as well. He said, You should just start throwing a bunch of names at him. I said, No, I just got one. Just one. Wow. Did you have a good weekend? Lovely. Great to be on your 50th show. Absolutely. It's a big honor. <laughs> as, I told my, as I told my dad on episode 47, part of the culture now, you, do, you guys do know that, right? Part of those hoops across the mountain state culture. Who we're part of it now? Oh yeah, big deal. It's a big deal, especially in the Kanawha Valley. You know, as people as people know, I mean, you still don't know my name after four years. You know, he's doing a good job. I appreciate it both. <laughs> we think the world of you. Oh, I know. I think the world of both of you as well. <laughs> what is his real name? Tanner. Tanner. I knew it was. Tanner. It's great to be here with you. Well, it's also funny because there was a running gag whenever I was in high school that my parents finally told me that I was adopted <laughs> two years straight i, I believed it not but gonna you're lie. not as I, I don't know that yet. how old were you when they would tease you about that 16 to 17 years old but i was very gullible oh. then now you really believed them oh i did oh, seriously I, le- I legitimately did because my dad i mean you've have you seen old, you've seen old pictures of my dad i do not look like my dad at all and i don't really look like my mom at all a younger version of my mom i should say but you ever done that ancestry.com my genetic uncle test has. my uncle has what about you I mean, you might want, right, Brett? Have you done that? Yeah, I have. Have you really? Mm-hmm. I've got a box. I haven't done it. I oh, need to I did do it. it. I need it to do pretty, it. It uh, was pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. So what, how does it work? I don't know how it does. You spit. Spit into a tube. Send it to them. They mark your DNA. They check your DNA. And then they'll tell you what your DNA is similar to as far as groupings around the world. So it'll let you know, like, where your DNA ancestry comes from. Pretty interesting. My uncle actually, so like I said, my uncle did that, and come to find out, he has to go back and look, but I'm not going to confirm it, this is just anecdotal, but he said that we might have ties to the Hatfields and McCoys. Well, sure, why not? That could happen. That's not that, that's not that far removed. No, but as, as everybody says, there's always a Kennedy connection, so. Is that what everybody says? That's what my family says. First Your family I, says First that. time I've ever heard of it. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's like everybody says. I mean, everybody knows my dad. I mean, I told my dad he's now a celebrity now. I mean, I'm not kidding you. We went to Puerto Rico. You like this. We went down to Puerto Rico <laughs> in 2010. In 2010, the year after they played in the Final Four, they had the Puerto Rico invitation. We're, we're in a restaurant across the, uh, across the street from the hotel. Guy comes up to my dad, gives him a pat on the back and says, Chris Kennedy, how are you doing today? My dad said, who are you? <laughs> he says, I'm so-and-so. And they just literally talked for five, ten minutes. Same situation happened in California, too. It's amazing. I know. I told my dad he's a celebrity now. And he's like, I, dude, trust me, I've been a celebrity. <laughs> I'm like, I, I now believe it now. Yeah. Pretty he's interesting. A, he's an interesting character, to say the <laughs> least. <laughs> Never thought you'd go into that ancestry and Chris Kennedy to start off. <laughs> but, no, I, I appreciate you guys joining me for this episode. But we're going to go down a bunch of different avenues with this episode uh, I think to first start off, um, I want to ask you both about how you guys both came to West Virginia. I know you're a New York native, and I know you're an Ohio, uh, Ohio, Iowa native, but um, I just want to ask, how did you guys get to West Virginia to begin? I'll start with you, Tony. Uh, looking for a first job out of college. It was seven weeks after I graduated. Got a phone call from Hoppy Kerchival, who knew the news director at the student radio station at Syracuse and he said hey I'm looking for a radio news guy and for whatever reason the student news director um, said I got a guy for you but I didn't want to do news I wanted to do sports and uh, so Hoppy followed up with a phone call 
Uh, my first conversation with him was basically told him I wasn't interested because I thought I had a job in York, Pennsylvania. And then the York, Pennsylvania thing did not happen. And I called him back and I said, hey, I really am a news guy. And he said, all right, come down. And I did. I interviewed. And the long story short is that there was another person that was also being interviewed for the position. At one point, Dale Miller, uh, the president of West Virginia Radio Corporation, went to Hoppy and said, hey, well, how are we going to fill this job? What are we doing here? What's going on with it? And he said, well, I got this one dude who's graduated, and I got this young lady from up the road in PA. And when Dale, as you well know, Dale, Dale's like, well, let, 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 let's go. Let's go do something. There, flip a coin. So he, he takes a quarter out, flipped it, said, get the guy. And that was it. So you came down to do news. That was the job. The job was I was supposed to be the afternoon news guy at WAJR. Yes, that's that was the job. And that lasted. I did I did news from August of 84, you know, probably for 18, 24, well, 24 months, maybe even a little bit longer than that. But I very soon grabbed a hold of starting to do other things, sports, anything that I could do other than news. But I kept the base for news, you know. Just, just despite what you told Kirchival that you did do news, you, did, you didn't want to know part of news. None. Right. None. So how did you get associated with the MSN network? Because of Hoppy. Because Hoppy was doing uh, television features for their coaches shows each week, and it became a little bit too busy for him. He had other things that were going on. And he said, hey, I'm out. And Mike Parsons was the executive producer at the time of MSN. And so he said, hey, do you want to be do you want to try to do these things? Would you be interested? And I said, absolutely. I mean, at that point, I would have done any. I mean, when I say I would have done anything, like if there was a cab company here and they needed someone to say, like, I want to go down Pattison and drive Kroger's got to pick up. I'd do anything, anything on a microphone, anything, name it. I would do it. And so uh, that's how that relationship started. Brad, when you first got to West Virginia, what was your initial thought whenever you first stepped in the Mountain State? My first thought was I had no idea where I was from this standpoint. I was at the University of Maryland working in their athletic department when I got a call to come interview over here for WVU. And I was at a fundraising, a Terrapin Club fundraising event over near the Eastern Panhandle. So I thought, well, that'll, that'll work out nicely. I'll just go to that and then just head over that night, interview the next day for the West Virginia job. I drove in, and the directions I was given, to my defense, <laughs> I won't say the person's name that gave me the directions, although they still are employed by the athletic department. Michael Fergal? No. No, was not. But Mike the person Parsons? Is, I'm not gonna, no, no, I'm not going to say it. It's, a cur it's still a current employee. Horrific instructions. Bad directions. So I come in late at night. And I got off, if you're familiar with Morgantown, as you're listening to this, what used to be the Glenmark exit. Sure. Right? Very popular. Came down the hill and missed the all-important left to go up <laughs> Easton Hill. I continued on straight Point up past Marion. the Pines Country Club, around and out past now the entrance or the road that you go to to get to University High School. Sure. And Baker's kept going. Ridge. And it wasn't long before the giant sign met me that said, welcome to Pennsylvania. <laughs> Yeah. And I said, welcome to Pennsylvania. <laughs> Must not have been as up on my geography as I thought. Didn't realize we were that close to Pennsylvania. Yeah, you're right Totally there. flummoxed. Long story <laughs> short. Drove around, <laughs> drove around for two hours. Made my way back, past the WVU farm, came back. And I'm looking for Euro suites. This is a true story. Now, this is in the old days, right? This is 95. So cell phones, scarce. 24-hour sheets, convenience stores, Not non-existent. There. GPS? Oh, GPS. Garmin? No Garmin? GPS. No. Garmin? I got my State Farm Atlas in the back, but that wasn't helping me much. Yeah. So I'm doing these loops. <laughs> so I end up down the, the main drags, end up downtown. I'm thinking, I, like I was just in Pennsylvania. Now I'm downtown. So there were the, my first impression was... There are pockets of activity in Morgantown where there's businesses and lights and other big stretches where there's not. Now, remember, I lived at the time 10 minutes outside, uh, halfway between Baltimore and D.C. 
So seeing no traffic was not something I was used to at that time. I kept doing these loops for two hours. Uh, Finally, the only way I found the Euro Suites, only way I found it, I was parked at the stoplight with the Euro Suites just to my right, and I'm sitting there, and I was starting to get a little bit of a panic because I'm thinking, well, what? I mean, what do I do here? There's the Coliseum. I'm going to end up there tomorrow. Do I just go there and spend the night? <laughs> what do I do? I happen to look over, and the Euro Suites has one of those little teeny signs. About two feet tall. Because I kept looking for us. Like, I'm looking yeah. up. Like, where? I'm driving, looking up. Like, where's the sign for Euro Suites? I just happened to look over at the stoplight and went, you got to be kidding me. Because I'd been by that spot. 75 times in the two hours. Yeah. Pulled in, went to bed, interviewed, got up the next day. I have a similar deal. I've, you've probably heard the story a thousand times. So the very first time I came here for the interview, it was a Sunday afternoon in July, and I got off the Saberton exit. And I had to get off the Saberton exit, and at that time, in 1984, it was very less populated. Correct. There was Kroger. There was a gas station. Gucci there Kroger, Southern by the way. States. That's, that's Gucci not Kroger. Gucci Kroger. That's Gucci no. Kroger. No, it's no not. not that not one. Not Saberton. Saberton. The joke. Saberton. So, Hardee's. Um, a, a West Banco, I think, was there. I don't know what the name was at that. Maybe a pizza shop mixed yeah. in there or something. I yeah. thought that that was downtown Morgantown. Mm-hmm. And I looked around and I said, I am so freaking out of here tomorrow. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world is this? This is Morgantown? Route 7 in Saberton. So eventually, that afternoon, I wheeled around the hogback turn, made the turn up Brockway, and got onto High Street. Again, July 1984 on a Sunday. Just three people walking around. Maybe not even don't three. Know if there were three. Probably yeah. a tumbleweed, too. Yeah. Don't know if there were three. And there were about four cars in the front of Masulo's dry cleaners, and they all had their hoods up showing off their engines. Chevy SS Novas, Trans Am, you know, they were just, um, and, I, and I drove by and I went like, I think I've died and gone to the scene of happy days. I mean, what are we doing? Because, yeah. you know, Masulo's had that kind of look like Arnold's yes. from happy yeah, days. Yeah. So I called my mom. I said, hey, I'm now, here. Do you think anybody listening to this podcast knows what happy days, happy, happy days is? Eh, I do. Probably not. I do. Probably not. It's unusual that you do. So a big old time guy too. I, um, I called my mom and I said, hey, again. I'm here. I'll do this interview just to get experience of doing an interview, but I'm out of here. This place is like really super weird, old, you know, <laughs> There's no, it's just old. And then the next day I interviewed and what blew me out was the equipment that they had at West Virginia Radio Corporation at the Greer building because it was state of the art equipment. Super cutting edge. Super cutting edge because yeah. I had just in previous like three, four months earlier had been at WNBC in New York for the Big East tournament. And went there and looked at their gear. And their gear was the same as the gear at West Virginia Radio. And I'm going like, wait a second. Something, this is, there's something going on here. So then I figure, I found out, you know, hey, one of our biggest commitments is to great equipment and top, top quality everything. And I went like, hmm, okay. And that was one of the things. I think if this, I, in all seriousness, I think if it was horrifically bad gear and it just looked like a pit, I probably you would have walked. I would have walked. Gear sold you. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it was cutting edge. I'm going like, yeah, this is good stuff. So, I do have a question for you, by the way. Do you know who Bob Williams is? He's the coach at West Virginia Tech. Know the name. He's from New York, too. He's upstate New York. Went to Ithaca College. Right. Coached there a few years. Played there as well. Great guy. Just didn't know if you knew. I, I, I figured that since everybody in West Virginia knew each other, I figured that everybody <laughs> in New York would know each nah, other, too. New York State's a little bit different uh, when it comes to, like, See, in West Virginia, everyone cares, no matter where you're from. Like, we're in the Welch, Martinsburg to Matewan, all points in between. Like, you can go anywhere. Like, you go out in Eastern Panhandle and talk to someone and say, hey, you know so-and-so? Yeah, Jackson County? Yeah, okay, no. New York State, it's so massive that it just d- doesn't exist like that. Like, if you're in Western New York, where I'm from, like, people have no idea or care what's going on in <laughs> Central New York, what's going on downstate New York City like it's a different it's two different worlds I mean here here'll give you an idea of it it takes me a shorter drive to get from my hometown to Morgantown than it would for me to go to New York City from my hometown by about two and a half three hours that's I could be in more I can be in my home in four and a half hours from here and to go to New York City it'd be like seven hours seven and a half so it's a different world 
I hate the subway system in New York City, by the way. Absolutely hate it. Anyway. Um, Brad, so when you look back at whenever you shot subways for really no reason, yeah, I didn't think it was well, I mean, at all. I mean, you guys have worked, worked for me about four years now. I mean, you guys know me. I, I get confused sometimes and that subway system is very confusing. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, you'd be better off with Uber. I would think for him. Don't you, Brad? <laughs> hey, I'm or a, just the old school taxi, old school taxi, just hail, just a taxi. hail taxi. You'd be better. I'm off. an investor in Lyft, by the way. Yeah. The same. Anyway. Brad, whenever you first got to West Virginia Radio Corporation, how did that all come into fruition? So that came about, I had left the athletic department and it was about a year or so later and I was over, Tony and I were working on a project not related to radio or WV sports. And we were, as we often did when I worked in the department, having a conversation about, about sports and railing on somebody or something and and he simply just he said to me well, when are you going to come say that on the show and i said i don't know invite me on the show i'll come on the show so he invited me on the show i came on the show and i just never left just squ- like squatters rights he invited me in i it was probably just a guest appearance and i just said oh good this is kind of fun i'll do this and just squatted never left now was that over in saberton the bill yeah. yeah it was he started in saberton but i came to later find out from brad's mom who's a great listener listens each night when we're on from Iowa, that he that's something that he had always aspired to do, broadcasting, but he'd never pulled a trigger on it. I think it worked out actually better for him the way that he did it had he gone conventional. I really do believe that. Because you gain this incredible amount of intellectual property in collegiate athletic administration, which you would not have had. Right. And if you Agreed. if you just would have went straight into broadcasting, you just would have been just another Joe. But now now he's got like he got he's got the understanding of how that world works. So it's interesting you bring that up because I I have a question I was going to ask you later on, but since you brought it up, so a lot of young people I think forget the point of how much goes into this industry. I'll ask the both of you this. So from your perspective, what does it take to be a successful broadcaster, sports reporter, reporter in general? What does it take? What are some qualities you have to have, Tony? I'll start with you. Just work, work. I think everyone nowadays I see people don't have the level of commitment that you have to have in order to do it. And I say this a lot of times when I go to speak to whatever groups of, you know, students that are younger that want to be in it. If you're someone that counts how many hours a week that you work, if you're someone who asks for a comp day after you've worked for a certain number of days, if you value your weekends if you value your nights, and if you value your holidays, this is not the business long-term for you because they play sports at night, on weekends, and on holidays. And if you're going to separate yourself from the very large supply of people that want to get into this business, then you better put your face into the fan and just work your ass off. And those that do that that have a level of talent along with that work ethic, I've never seen anyone not be successful. So oftentimes what happens is there are a lot of people that say they want to do it, and then when they get exposed to it and what it really is, they they take a detour, which is completely cool and fine. I totally understand and get that that's what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to kind of find out where you fit. And I think a lot of times what this business is is surprising to people when they think from the outside they know what it is but when they see what it actually is i think it surprises them and oftentimes i think it disappoints them too because it's not all you know it's, it's not, not puppy all, dogs and ice cream no it's not all fun fun he 100 percent agree with that i mean and that's probably number one two and three on the list and i would just dovetail on the back of that to add to that prepare right over prepare know what you're talking about dive into what you're talking about. And when you go into it, walk out of each show, whatever that show is, whether that shows a game, whether that shows a podcast, whether that shows an on-air live program, walk out with information that you didn't get out. That's the key. You never want to be left with, uh, what should we talk about now? Work, be available, and over-prepare. And I know that sounds simple. And then I think Tony's exactly right with lower expectations. It takes a long time. You've got to grind it and work it before you may see a breakthrough. You may be pushing content out constantly with no reaction. 
You just got to keep showing up and doing work. Can okay. I interject as well, just to add to that? You may. What was the original question? What qualities okay. or what traits does somebody have? Yeah, one additional thing I would add is that I really am strongly, over the last several years, couple of years, leaning toward also encouraging people to become an expert in one particular area of their field. Become that expert. And I think that will uh, distinguish you and you will stand apart from all of the others that are trying to, uh, to get work. So I always tell this story about a buddy of mine who's in the NBA. They hired an intern. He just came in to do anything and everything. And he took a great affinity toward the NBA salary cap. And he became the guru of what the salary cap was. And the front office would call him in and go, okay, all right, here's what we got. This deal, this deal, and this deal. Can we do this? Can we do that? So here's a guy that came in as an intern. He becomes the expert. Well, suffice it to say, he's been in the league now for 20-plus years and has ascended in. You know, same thing with Brad, whether he did it intentionally or unintentionally. You know, his aspect and his little edge is sports betting. He took that as it became legal in West Virginia, and now he does his own show. And so that expertise sets him apart from everybody else. So I do think that it's strong to, do, to be good at a lot of different things, but I think those that make themselves expert in a field, in any line of work, if you become the expert in the field, you'll have people coming to you more so than you having to go to seek after employment. Well, it's, it's great that you brought up Brad's podcast because, Brad, I'll ask you, since you started your show, how have you sort of seen the side of sports betting and gambling in the state of West Virginia grow since it became legalized a few years back? Yeah, it's just continued. I mean, the the industry as a whole and the, the legal betting side of it just continues to explode. We see more seats, st states coming on board with that month after month after month with still some really big states to come. So I think that industry itself is still in the ramp up stage. We haven't even come close to hitting the peak of where that market's going to be. And I think West Virginia is no different. And that continues as we do our show, The Game Within the Game, the podcast. And that was kind of what I talked about earlier. That's a show that's starting from starting from scratch that, that nobody knew about. So you just have to keep pushing out. And you keep having conversations and you have good guests on that know the business, which we do. And you keep having those conversations around that world. And it just continues to grow and educate. We always say that educate and entertain. That's what we're trying to do. Double E, as we like to call it, I guess. But... So you mentioned the peak. What would that peak be? I mean, have you ever thought about what that peak could possibly be? For sports betting? Correct. Oh, my. I mean, there's just so much runway left. Think about that. California's not on board. New York's not on board. Texas is not on board yet. So just from a sheer standpoint of numbers of people that could be interested in that and do that legally, that ramp up still exists. And I think you're going to continue to see teams and leagues get more involved in that on an upfront basis. You're starting to see that now. You're going to see that more and more, and those that world is going to merge with the television world, I think, really quickly here. There was something a few months back about how a couple of professional teams incorporated a sports book inside their stadium. Do you think that's going to be just another outlet for how this is going to continue to grow? Yeah, I think you'll continue to see teams try and do that because it, it adds to the revenue for the teams, and that's what every league and every team is trying to do is how can they get new revenue the betting space, the sports gaming space is one area to do that. But the mobile is really massive. I mean, that's that's really where the growth is going to be is on the, the online, the mobile that's in your hand while you're watching the game and the live in-game betting is a niche part of that industry that is continuing to grow at a rapid pace. And I think that's going to explode here over the next couple of years. Now, what's your favorite thing to do? In betting or I mean, in game slash live game betting or pre-game betting? Uh, depends on the sport. I like both. I think each each of those brings something different to the table. The pregame stuff I enjoy because the research that goes into before you place a wager, finding out the matchups if it's Major League Baseball, the pitcher versus batter. I like the research aspect of it as much as I do the placing of the bet. And then if you're sitting watching the game, but you got to be careful on in-game. I mean, you can go sideways on in-games in a hurry. So you better know what you're looking at. You better pay attention, and you better have all of your focus on the game if you're going to try and bet in-game. I'll tell you what, I've had a good story with live game betting. I think I told you the story before. So last year, I'm sitting in here doing the Metro News uh, High School Game Night Show with Fred Persinger, and <laughs> the Red Sox were playing the Yankees. It was a September game, late September game, and I said, okay, just fart around with it. 
you know, doing the show, had my phone in the other hand. I'm just like, okay, let's do this. So I go to do it. Yankees, I did the Yankees plus 250, I think. No, it was the under. It was the, no, what was it? It was the over. That's what it was. Over. So the over was set at eight and a half in a live game betting. Score was, score was two to, two to four going into the bottom of the seventh. So I needed some runs. Did he just say two to four? I meant four to two. I meant four to two. Oh, okay. I meant four to two. Thank you. Thank you. But anyways, <laughs> I needed, I needed. He really said two to four. I know. I think he just got tongue tied there. Okay, he go ahead. Four to My two. sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you for the criticism, by the way. Anyway, um, but yeah, I needed some runs. So the Yankees, I think it was Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge steps up to the plate. It's a line drive in the left center. Gap shot. Two runs come out. I'm like, okay, we're good. Red Sox come up. And then I'm like, okay, I just need one, I just need one hit. It took him until the, bo- until the top of the ninth to get the hit. I was sweating bullets. And the Yankees, thank God they didn't do anything else because, you know, I, just, I was content with where I was at. So you cashed. Oh, I cashed big. It was like a five dollar. It was like a five dollar thing, but as as you like wait, to call wait, it, wait. little pizza money sort of thing. You you said you cashed big. Yeah, five dollars. Yeah, to me that's big. Because you know I don't win a lot. Okay, that's cool. That's good. See, but I think that's an important point there on the dollar amount. It doesn't matter if the dollar amount's two dollars, three dollars, five dollars, or a thousand dollars. Whatever whatever you're comfortable with, that's what you should do. More people should take that. Who cares if it's five? The money to me in in that world. Unless you're doing it professionally, the money's a little bit irrelevant. It's more about the the chase and the being right than it is the money. So I always encourage people, please play responsibly. <laughs> one 800 gambler to be exact. Uh, anyway, we're continuing our conversation with Hoppy Caridi and Brad Howe on episode 50 of Hoops Across the Mountain State. And we're continuing this discussion. And, you know, Brad bought a... Brad- do you have a sponsor? No, I do not. I'm working on that currently. But anyways... 50 oh, shows in? No sponsor yet? No, but we are making t-shirts, though. We are making t-shirts. Zach, can you bring up the t-shirt design, please, on the video stream? As you, as we slowly get there. Oh, there we go. Boy, that's never been done before. The outline of the state of West Virginia. Are those on sale? Not yet. Not yet. We're, get, we're, we're working there. That's the front design and the back design. Yeah, there it is. I that's, can see they didn't use your body as the model. Nope. Thank God they didn't. I'm going to take up the whole screen if I did. But yeah, it's pretty nice. So is this show about basketball? Yeah. What's the name of the show? Hoops Across the Mountain State. We haven't even talked about basketball yet. We're getting there. Oh, we're going to get there. Yeah. Well, this is a, it's a hell of an appetizer to get to the main meal here. Okay. Hey, I'm a big appetizer guy, so I'm a, I love appetizers. But anyway, so, you know, let's talk about, you know, the pregame side of it because Brad talked about how much research you go into it to go into a bet. But, Tony, I'll ask you, so going into a game day or even a game week for that matter, how important is the research side of what you do as a, as a play-by-play broadcaster? It's absolutely everything. It's absolutely everything you can't do one without the other and I think if you ever try to do it then you will quickly come tumbling down so preparation and knowing the story because in essence what you're doing is you are telling a story in real time unlike reality tv this is real (laughs) reality tv is fake um, reality and sports is actually happening and so in order to tell a story you've got to know what the story is So you have to be prepared and you have to plan and you have to know all of the different characters so that when the story evolves in front of you, you have to be able to make the inferences, you have to be able to educate, you have to be able to explain to your listeners why what just happened is important. And so if you don't have the background and the basis of information, then you're not serving your audience the way that you should. So it's, uh, it's, it's the gold standard. Had you ever thought about doing TV before you started, you know, doing radio full time? I did. I did TV. Oh, okay. Yeah, I did TV. Um, what was your face? Not talk- pre- was, your, was your face not pretty enough for TV? Was that your attempt at humor again? It was S- three swings and a miss. Anyway, I fouled once. So. Um, no, I did TV play by play before I did radio play by play. So um, I did that for. My very first TV stuff was MSN TV. We would do a number of games every year, football, basketball. Then it branched off to um, the Atlantic 10 Network. I did a few games for ESPN here and there. Uh, Prime Network back in the day, um, that kind of stuff. So I did that first. Uh, And then uh, radio I started to do more so in the early like 90, 91, I would do the Westwood one college football game of the week. 
And then in 96, started doing West Virginia radio. You know, but on that, tell, I think you tell people that because that, that brings a, a whole set of challenges on itself that are different from when you're doing a play, team play-by-play. I mean, you were going into those games having to learn both teams. Mm-hmm. So that's an especially tall task, I think, when you're doing those national games where you don't have a basis where you're watching at least one team every time. Right. Yeah, right? You're absolutely, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, starting, it's starting from scratch um, every week. Now, when I would do the Atlantic 10 game, obviously, I would see every team in the league multiple times, so it became easier. But you're right. Like, they all of a sudden, you get a phone call, and they say, hey, you're going to do Texas, Texas A&M, um, you know, football. You're going to do Georgia, Tennessee football. You jump in, and you have to learn both of those teams really quick. So, yeah, and, you know, there, there's good and bad to it. The good is you can be absolutely, completely neutral and have no care in the world who wins. You just hope for a great game. Whereas when you're doing a school, you know, you are so much more emotionally involved in that school because, quite honestly, you know, my job and my life's a lot easier when West Virginia wins. And so you're emotional when you're doing a team's game, but you're right from a preparation perspective – it's a lot easier to prepare week to week for WVU because I've got one team and I just, you know, you're over there every pretty much four or five times in the course of a week. You just have all that information. The other team you have to learn about. Let's dive into some basketball. Then, since the main podcast name is Hoops Across the Mountain State and you guys had the opportunity to call the class AAA girls state championship game against Nitro and Fairmont Senior and even going into that game, people thought that Fairmont Senior was going to be a runaway with that game from the start. But as we all know, Bailey Goins, who was one of the uh, co-players of the year this past season with Marley Washington as well. But going into that game, what were your guys' thoughts about what kind of game you guys were about ready to call? I can, either one of you can start. Well, I, th- I mean, you just outlined it. I think the the high end talent that existed in that game was what the attraction was early. And you mentioned the players right there. I mean, that was the that was the fun part of that game. And it was just remarkable how that changed quickly when Bailey Goins went down with that injury and how much she meant to that team. And then to watch the rest of that Nitro group with Lena Elkins and Taylor Maddox come together and work their way through. Because think about what they had to do right there. They had the mental aspect of watching Bailey go down and have to be carried off into the back. So they had the mental, we've got to overcome that, versus the on-court logistics and physical of Bailey Goins was not just a 2,000-point scorer. She was the main ball handler for that team as well. So their roles on the Nitro team changed in an instant, and they mentally had to prepare and physically. I still think, Tony, I think you agree with me, that's one of the more remarkable things I've seen in sports is what that team was able to do in that moment with that loss of personnel and find a way to win that state title. Simply incredible. I would totally agree. At any level, that was one of the great sports stories I've ever seen for all of those reasons. You had the number one ranked team that was undefeated. You had one of the premier players in the state, and she becomes injured. And horrifically, I mean, she's in a ton of pain, so her teammates see her writhing on the floor. And at that time, if – you know, you looked at that, and anyone said, well, I think I think Nitro's going to win this game. You would have went like, whoa, I can't see that happening. I thought, to be quite honest with you, that when play resumed, it was going to be a boat race, and that Fairmont Senior would just start rolling, and they wouldn't have any answer. And that's why the way that they played, and then to win that game, that was one of the all-time great sports moments, stories that I'd never seen. I talked to... Head, uh, Nitro Girls head basketball coach Pat Jones not so long ago, and he said that Bailey got surgery a few weeks back, and she's slowly progressing. You know, it's not going to be like a, a snap of the finger kind of thing, but he's saying that she's that she's coming along quite well, and she's actually picked up a um, a scholarship, and she actually committed to a community college. I think it's Patola College Community College, but you know, she was a tremendous ball player, and so was a lot. Of, so were a lot of the players on Fairmont Senior as well. But the next week, you all had the opportunity to call my alma mater. The Winfield Fairmont Senior game. Now, before we go into that discussion, people people think that it was your guys' fault. By the way, I had a couple of people from Winfield whenever I've been home the last couple of weekends. They said, uh, "You're good. You know Tony and Brad, right?" I said, "Yeah, why?" And they're like, "I, I think they might have hurt that game for Winfield." And I said, "No, it was a shady, shady spring game. Excuse me." Anyway, they said they might have hurt that game for us. And I said, 
I, I don't know about that much. Uh, I don't know. Unfounded accusation. Oh, absolutely. Hey, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a messenger. I'm a shepherd. That's all we are. We're just the messengers. We, we report. You decide. But uh, Shady Spring was really impressive. Huh. That was, uh, that was fun to watch. I, I loved those two weeks. I, I had been to the state tournament for like every year for twenty plus years, and have not been because of the NCAA tournament. And to get back there and all the weirdness because of COVID. And to watch those games, I thought it was uh, it was really super fun. It's a great. It was a great two weeks between the the boys and the girls. But but you're right. The and the, and the fun really to me of of those tournament settings, especially when it's a state tournament that has long lasting decades, lifetime ramifications for those kids that are playing, those fans that are watching that. To be able to watch those individual performances step forward, the team performances come out that we talked about with Nitro, that's what's really fun about big moments and which players are going to step up in those big moments. And we saw a ton of those performances over those two weeks. I, I love those two weeks down in Charleston. So, Tony, when was the last time that you were back down in Charleston for the state tournament prior to this year? I have no recollection. And I know that, that sounds like a deposition answer, <laughs> but uh, I really don't remember. I, I don't remember when it was. Um, I'm sure we could, I don't know, track it down somewhere somehow off tape or something. But I, I don't remember what it was. But uh, I, uh, for a bunch of different reasons, being able to go down there this year uh, was just uh, was really really enjoyable. It's just it's the a first great year event. you did it was what year? First year you did state tournament. Well, I know I did it in '87 by myself. Yeah, how many games? Fourteen. Excuse me. By myself. <laughs> You lined up, did 14 games. Yep, 14 games, 19. With equipment that probably wouldn't fit in this room right now, right? <laughs> oh, no, no. That was a suitcase. It was like, it was, I, I brought the mixing board, a headset, a heart, a regular old school telephone, an old school rotary telephone. Like you had to punch the numbers or punch, do you dial? No, no, punch, punch the number. Okay, yeah. And Big receiver, Taylor. You know what an old school telephone looks like? I do, because I used to play with one when I was a child. Yeah, and it had a cart machine, which you we played old. our commercials on. 21. So that was December of 87. Hold on. I don't know if people know what cart machines are that you had commercials on. So I don't even know what Kind of like an, what, what would you describe, like an eight track? Well, they probably don't know what eight tracks are either. Think of a cassette on steroids. I know what a cassette like is. Like you had to take the commercial and push it in and push hit a in. button to play it. <laughs> yeah. And I would go like, you know, it's what? 17, it's 17, 14. We're back after this from whoever the bank was. Push the button and the commercial go, and it would run. And at the end, hey, welcome back. So, like, when we were just down there a month or so ago and we would finish our game and, like, people would be right over our shoulder, like, trying to get us out of there because they had to sit down, do the game, clean everything. You would just sit there. Right. And you – so, between games, teams are warming up. That was your little bit of a break. And then the next game comes and you do it. Yes. And the next game comes and you do it. Yep. And there was, like, eight, nine in a day. Yeah. The thing you just calling games. Yes. Yeah, I did 14 games in four days. That was a, that was a 1987 that I'll never forget. Just – I was home – and out of 31 days, I was home seven days in the month of December. I went, I did that girl state tournament for four days. That got over on a Saturday. The next, uh, the next day, flew to Pensacola, Florida, and did a short track car race as a producer for wait, the radio network. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Short, what? Short track car race in Pensacola, Florida, Metro News. Metro but News. you were producing that. You didn't have to call didn't the action on, the air. on that. And, uh, yep. That was on Sunday. Flew back to Charleston on Monday. Uh, stayed overnight Charleston Monday. Tuesday, flew with the Marshall basketball team to Hawaii and did their games at a tournament in Hawaii. Came back home, maybe was here for a couple of two, three days. Went back on Saturday to Marshall. Did a Marshall game against, for some reason, I think it was Baylor in Huntington in 1987. Someone can check it. Came home that night late. That was the next day was Sunday. <laughs> Went over to the facilities building and left for the Sun Bowl for the bowl game in El Paso. Against Oklahoma State. Against Oklahoma State that we always talk about. So that was my December. Okay, now Taylor, we talked about preparation right there. How and how did you keep, to take the high school for just a how did you keep the high school name straight after your eighth or ninth game? That had to be difficult. No, it really isn't because, uh, you know, those preparation, you know, those packets, you know, those packets yeah. that we have this year. Well, that I created those packets back then for that specific reason. Okay. You have the two teams like 
put them down next to you. And then back then, there's no comp- I'm not wasn't using a computer. I hand wrote the the, sh- the scoring sheets on a legal pad, like Jack Fleming used stat to. Stat broadcast wasn't up there. Nah, running. no stat broadcast. And Jack Fleming, you know, used to use a legal pad, and he'd get a ruler out, he'd make cut it like a half, and then he'd put the names. I'd do the same thing. So I would do that, have them ready to go, and back then on press row there, where now everything's computerized and the whole thing, they would have, you know, Steve Joseph, who's still there, and his wife, they would do the play-by-play for the stats on a manual typewriter, and she would just be sitting there, how, basket, free throw, one and one, then they'd mimeograph it and they'd run it back to you. So it was wild. That was fun. Those were, those were fun times. Fun I, times. That is way before my time. But so you were saying that that was a 97, 98 collegiate basketball. 87. 80, oh, 87. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 1987, 88. So who would have been the coach then for Marshall? Oh, that was Rick Huckabee. And they had a team that was loaded. Got in a little trouble there because it was too loaded. <laughs> Not too long after, they had some situations with the NCAA, and that was Skip Henderson, and that was a lot of really good players. Maurice Bryson, Tom Curry, um, I want to say in that range, Andy Paul, I think Andy Paul Williamson was there too, yep. and they were really good. They were really good. I Want to hear a great story about that? That just blew me away. By the way, I'm 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 literally I have the roster up right now, and that just blew me away that you knew all like at least a quarter of those guys like that. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny story. We flew all day to get to Hawaii. That's a shot, right? That's a trip. Charleston to Chicago, Chicago to L.A., L.A. to Honolulu, and we check into the hotel. Aloha. We check into the hotel, and so you're dragging, and West Virginia is playing Pitt in basketball on the USA Network at that time so i'm like all fired up i get to the hotel and i'm going to try to find usa network to watch this game we're not in the room for 45 minutes knock on the door it was student manager and they said hey we're leaving well what i'm i'm sitting there like it just had my bag we're leaving huck doesn't like this hotel you had to change hotels got your stuff walked down the street what Walked with your with stuff. With your bag? With your bags. No you carried your bags out of yeah. the hotel and walked No Uber? Down? No Uber. Walked with your bags from whatever hotel we were in that had like cinder block walls. And it was okay, but it was nothing special. Walked over to the Sheridan Waikiki. <laughs> so you upgraded. W- upgraded, walked right in. Good to see everybody. <laughs> so yeah, good times, man. They put one of those uh, lays around your neck when you yeah, first walked they did. in? Yeah, they did the whole thing. Yeah, they did the whole thing. So I got to mention this. I'm, gl- I'm really glad you brought this up because somebody wanted me to ask you if you had, if you had ever called a Marshall game. So, oh, yeah, I did several. So one of my family's lifelong friends, his name's John Young, went to college there, uh, was a student manager, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, he, he asked me, he's like, ask, ask Tony if he ever called a Marshall game. And I said, okay. This was like a month ago. So, John, if you're listening to this, I'm, I'm just not getting to it, by the way. Yeah, multi- I did multiple. I did the whole tournament down there in Hawaii. Then I came back. I did the Baylor game. And then we went out. This was Southern Conference. I did East Tennessee State. And I did VMI. And I think I did Appalachian State, too. Because at that time, Marshall's football team was in the playoffs. And that was when they played for the national championship in 87 in Pocatello, Idaho. Bill Roth was their play-by-play announcer. And he stayed with football. And at that time, West Virginia Radio Corporation had the broadcast rights for the Marshall Network. We did the Marshall Network. So that was why I went over and did it. You guys have actually called some Marshall football games, if I'm not mistaken, too. The both of you have. For their bowl games? Oh, yeah, we did. Bad Boy Mowers Gasparilla Bowl. Yeah, we did. Absolutely. Get a lot of gear with them? Yeah, I got, I got, we got nice gear. Never Bad got, Boy Mowers gear. Never full, Never got the mower, but we got hats. Tried for a mower. Yeah, I tried for a mower, didn't bite Couldn't on that. Couldn't figure out how to get it home. <laughs> what do you got, one of those push mowers and one of those riding mowers? Oh, no, no, they're no, all no, about no, zero. No, no, I'm talking about what you have. I currently have a uh, push. Yeah. No, I ride. You ride? Yeah. <laughs> I'm more of a pusher myself, so... I Thanks. like that. Yeah. Good leg workout, by the way. Yeah. But um, no, but so Brad, whenever you look back at your athletic department career, whenever you look, when, look back at all those basketball games that you attended as well, you got any funky stories like he just said with going to Hawaii and having to change hotels? Oh, my gosh. Oh, geez, dude. Are you oh. kidding me? A, a, bil- a billion. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know where to start with a, 
with a story. I, I will say that I think that you know, there's been so many memorable moments. The game beating Kentucky to go to the Final Four is is way up the list. I mean, that was that was really fun. And you know, you get into you get into college athletics, you get into athletics because you love the sport of it, right? And so, getting to a Final Four, being part of a organization that made it to a Final Four was always if not right at the top of my bucket list, was was way up there. And, and that happened later in my career. So that was really special. The run through the Big East tournament the first time when John Beeline was there that then rolled into the run to the Elite Eight was kind of an interesting, interesting part of athletics. I think you look at it from the standpoint, I always said being involved in athletics was the best and the worst experience from this standpoint. You felt the wins and losses so much more because it affects your life so deeply. So that was a great example of that. The run through there, through Madison Square Garden, getting to the Big East Championship game, and then the Elite Eight, unbelievable run and fun and something I'll never forget. But the loss to Louisville in a game that you were ahead, that you should have won, could have won, needed one basket or one defensive rebound, and West Virginia's in the Final Four at that point, that's as low and as big of a gut punch as, as I have felt in that sort of business. So it was kind of the, the high and low of that business. But I, I mean, I could go on for four hours on stories and memories about fun, fun things that happen. Well, speaking of that Final Four team, the TBT is slowly upon us down at the Charleston Regional. Heard that and Best Virginia will be competing and be the host of that. Best Virginia coming as a two seed and heard that as a three seed in that side of the bracket. But when you guys look at this roster from top to bottom, what do you guys sort of what's the what's the common trend you're seeing with this year's team? I think that they learned in the first year that it isn't as geared toward big men play. Five men aren't as the gold standard, perhaps that conventional college basketball is. I think that they found out that what you really need are great guards and great wings. I think that's probably the biggest takeaway. I'm very intrigued to see exactly how these guys uh, come together and play. they got a lot of players, man. It's going to be fun. This, this is fun. I think this is just a really fun, neat event. First of all, credit to the, the TBT group for putting this idea together because it's fun. And then you just take this West Virginia team and being able to miss, mishmash up players from different eras that you talk about all the time but never got to see play together, I think that's awesome. That makes this experience really fun. And I'm with Tony. I think this particular version of the team with all of the different pieces it has, it's got a lot of players on there. So not only style of play will be interesting, but just roles and who accepts what role and who becomes the go-to scorer and who takes a back seat from scoring. Because every one of these guys in their professional career can go get you buckets when you need them. So how do they manage those roles among the players? I think that'll be fun to watch. Seth Greenberg brought up an interesting point during the uh, reveal show of the bracket, and he said that he really likes what they did with getting the old guys and mixing them in with the new guys, like he guys just said as well. So, you know, I think also when you look at this team from top to bottom, you got Alex Ruoff in there, who growing up, you know, I, I pretty much watched him as well. But then you go now to newer times, you got Tariq Phillip as well, Tavon Myers, Juwan Staten as well. You know, what do you think would take this team to make it all the way to the quarterfinal round outside of this Charleston Regional? Well, I think if you would ask Bob Huggins, he'd say, you know, we got to make shots. Got to make shots. I mean, that's what it's going to come down to. They're going to get looks. Got to make shots. I'm delighted that Alex is playing. I mean, Alex can absolutely still stroke it at a very high level. Um, like Brad said, this is going to come down to if these guys are willing to accept roles. That's what this will ultimately be determined by. I think they got the pieces. They could they they can make a run. It'll be fun. You got to accept your role. So connection. I, th I told you this a while back, but connection with Ruoff. So Chase Feeler, friend of the podcast, he uh, he just finished playing over in Germany. Lo and behold, played with Alex Ruoff as well. Same team or same league? Same team. Braze Bamberg, over in Germany. Are you saying that correctly? I am. I I literally practiced it at least eighty times before I got on with Chase. Whenever I had him on my podcast, took a while. <laughs> Those international team names are they're kind of out there, so I had to work on that one. Did he confirm that you said it correctly? He did. He did. I he, think he was just being nice. And I think a lot of people are just nice to be with. It. Probably. Well, you want to take a shot at it? No, I'm good. Okay, totally good. Just wanted to ask. But um, 
So continuing this basketball discussion, going back to the the prep level, Tony, and you know, you mentioned how you first started in '87. You actually called one of the more memorable games in high school basketball history between Martinsburg and Dupont in the early '90s. Whenever whenever Dupont had Jason Williams and Randy Moss, just going into that game, how much how much electricity was in that college in the Charleston Civic Center? Since now it's called the Charleston Convention Center and Coliseum. Those were some unbelievably fantastic times in West Virginia high school basketball. There was the great anticipation of those games. And for whatever reason, back then, Logan was really super good. Beckley was really just fantastic. And they all did have marquee players that fans knew across the state of West Virginia. And so when you had – you mentioned Jason Williams and Randy Moss. They also had Bobby Howard who goes on to play at Notre Dame in football and in the NFL for the Chicago Bears. So you're thinking about that. Three pro athletes on one West Virginia high school team. you got three pros. And then, you know, you've got on the Martinsburg side, Marcellus Basie, who not only was a great basketball player, but was a kid that was drafted um, by professional baseball. You just had all of these kinds of guys. So there was just this unbelievable buzz You'd get there on Tuesday for the state tournament, know that those teams perhaps weren't going to play until Thursday, and you could feel it then. Because those games, like middle of the – that mid-second game morning session, it's sold out. And when you're sitting there and it's March, and it's like 11.30 in the morning or 11.15 in the morning, and the place is filled from the floor to the ceiling, you go like, this is pretty good. And those are, those are just, you know, unforgettable moments – and uh, I was uh, I was I was thrilled, delighted that we could uh, that we could be part of that deal. I'll ask you both this. I I ask uh, my guests to put together a starting five of players that they played against, and I've got a lot of great answers with a lot of great names. But whenever you guys look at a lot of these players that you guys have seen play throughout the prep level, put together a starting five of guys that you've seen over the years, just in the either whether it be in the state tournament or a regular season game. Just give me a five if you could. I think these are the questions you're supposed to give to the guests before the show starts so they have a clue. Don't you think that's what they do I would, on, those would, big t- on would, those big podcasts? That would help. We're growing. That would probably help, wouldn't We're it? Growing. That would help. Like, hey, at the end, I'm going to ask you for your pick for your five favorites. All right. So you got to go. Well, heck, you could name you could name your five with guys you just mentioned right yeah, there. Yeah, I, I mean, Without I would just kind of stick of around in that range. 90. Boy, there was good players, man. Good players. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, Jason Williams is in that group. I mean, how do you do this? I, I would, I would see, like, go back to preparation. I want to, I want to sit down and like just put it all in front of me before I start pick choosing. I mean, from that era alone, you know, you talk about Ryan Colasurto at Beckley. You talk about Greg Bartram from Logan, who went over and played at Penn State. Um, you know, Tink Brown. At back, Tamar Slay played in the NBA. Ooh, Tamar Slay was. I good. mean, Tamar friend Slay. of the podcast, actually. Great. Oh yeah, he's a great guy. OJ yeah. Mayo was pretty good OJ, in high school. OJ Mayo. I mean, you could just go down the list. There's just so many good players. You know, a guy like a, a guy like Kevin Pitsnoggle, who may not have been, may not have put up 50 in the state tournament. Well, that might what Kevin Pitsnoggle went on to become at the college level, right? Changed the vernacular of March Madness. You've sure. been Pitsnoggled. Sure. And his deal was that, you know, he never really loved playing in the Civic Center, just didn't necessarily shoot the ball well. He never had good experiences there. And, um, oh, yeah, there's, there's been an incredible Brent number of Brett Nelson guys. could play a Brett little bit. Brett Nelson. It was a recent highlight tape of him. Huh. I, that was the first time I had ever seen him play basketball for St. Albans. He was pulling up like Steph Curry and Damian Lillard range. He, he, was, he was pretty much – he walked. That way Steph Curry and Damian Lillard could run. He was uh, a national recruit, and if you remember back in the day, Sporty News did like a, for lack of a better term, they did a diary during his whole se- season of recruitment. So yeah, he was he wasn't just a big West Virginia story; he was a national, a national recruit. Yeah, boy, tons of players, man, absolute tons of players. I mean, regardless, I mean, it's, it's still a good list. I mean, you gave you guys both gave a lot of great guys. Um, I can't even think of a list for whenever I played as well, but that's neither here nor there. But I want to talk about food. I know, I know that this this podcast is mainly basketball, but 
you know, when we get when we get together, usually food is a big topic. It's a topic of discussion. So this is now hoops and food across America. Yes, we or talk across West Virginia. Well, what's I, the name of the show? Hoops across the Mountain State. But whenever I talk with Chase, I ask him. I said, okay, what were some what were some things that you ate over in Germany? And he's like, chicken. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> Stand by. Just go chicken, no matter where. So he goes. didn't. He didn't get any local cuisine. He just went chicken. He he. No, not really. He was more of like a chicken guy. And then he, uh, him and his wife would go out and get desserts every now and again. But since COVID was still around over in Germany, he was he was over there for ten months. You'll like this. I know you will. So his sons were both born in international uh, overseas. They weren't born in the states. Right. So obviously they're going to teach the boys English, but at the same time. Everywhere they go, because he's been to Greece, he's now been to Germany, he's been everywhere over in over in Europe. But he told me that he's getting his sons to learn and become more fluent in a lot of these foreign languages. And he and he even like had his son come over after we finished our podcast, and he's like, "All right, tell tell uh, tell Taylor here just a couple things in German." Like that, I was blown away. I oh, never heard anybody. Smart. I never heard anybody speak German before. That's well done. It was awesome. Blown away. You've never heard anyone speak German? No. Language has been around for a while. <laughs> I'm well aware of that. Occasionally flipping through like AMC or something. Might have caught a little something. I didn't even think. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's invaluable. And when you're a young kid, your head's like a sponge. And you can pick up those languages. The, the, the challenge is, as he gets older, to be able to maintain it. You know, as soon as he comes back this way and the kids don't hear it every day, then it evaporates. I personally went through that myself. Yeah, what's your level of, of speaking versus understanding it if someone's speaking it to you? Yeah, so good. But when I was, um, well, how old are you when you go to seventh grade? 12? When I was 12, I went to Italy for a month. I came back and I spoke fluently. Fluently. And I remember going back, when on my way home, I stopped in Brooklyn for a couple of days and went into the Italian section in Brooklyn, and I would go into stores and not even think that I wasn't speaking English because they spoke Italian too, and I would just, everything was perfect. Now that For me to have that back, I would give anything to be able to do that again. Now when I go over now, I mean, I speak enough to get through and have any situations I can get through them, I can understand, you know, well, but I would give, I would love to be able to be just completely fluent. Do you still know anything that, you know, in Italian... Like, could you give, like, a sentence in, in Italian? Yeah, I can. All right. That wasn't one of the requirements for this podcast. I know. <laughs> could you? Well, sure, I could. Um, as long as it's PG. Well, yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, Just making sure. Um, what do you want to say? Like, for you, Taylor, since we're talking about food. Wait, sh should I get, like, Google like Google Voice out? That way I can get the translation of it, or you're going to get the translation? Yeah. We, can, we can say, uh, give away manjati. What do you want to eat? Food. Super simple, right? Yeah. Okay, something like that. I was expecting more, but it's okay. Okay, so back to food, since, we, since I just mentioned food. Okay. Got a question. You guys are on a deserted island. You get one choice for your main entree. What do you choose? So you're just going to have that all the time? I mean, you're going to live off of that? Like, yes. Wait. Oh, oh Wait. I'll, I'll restructure. I'll restructure. A, a one, yeah, clarify there. Is that a one-time meal, or is that I've got to live on that for the next however long I'm on that deserted island? So let's restructure the question. Th choose three entrees <laughs> that you have to eat to live off of for the rest of your life. What, what three entrees do you choose? Holy. Three entrees to live off for the rest of your life. Do you want me to give my three? I'd probably go. I mean, I just play it. I just play it simple. I would go with plants. I would go with fish, and I would go with meat. One of those three. Each of well, those. We got three. a farm over there. Yeah, you just asked me what my three are. I'd do something plant based. Well, you you green. answered that as if you've got to gather it. Yeah. He did not say that I had to gather it, so I was going to assume there's somebody dropping that in or making it for me. Okay. Go like, you, you answer that as if you have to gather it. Does it change if you don't have to gather and prepare? No. I'd take fish, I'd take meat, and I'd take greens. 
What kind of meat? That's pretty healthy by you. Yes. Yeah. What kind of meat? Oh, if I got to eat it every, I mean, this is the only meat I get. Like I can't like, I can't bounce between lamb and beef. You could choose, you could choose out, out of the one, out of all three entrees, you could choose one in the substitute every now and again. Lamb and uh, filet. I like lamb. Yeah, I was going to take filet. I'm a big lamb guy. Lamb and filet. I'd probably do like a filet. <laughs> got to get a mashed potato. if you're going to have a filet. I knew the potatoes were coming. And then probably just get me a, get, get me a pizza there to go with it. <laughs> Yeah. As I could eat pizza straight through for a long time. Seriously. I could go a long, a big number of days eating pizza. What do you I like on your pizza? I'm a pepperoni guy. Like, depends. If I'm just having one topping, I'd go pepperoni. Would like pepperoni and sausage as a combo if I can. Any vegetables on that? No. No banana peppers? No, thank you. Hmm. Interesting. Well, a little heat, put a little jalapeno pepper on there. I might do that. Ooh. Never tried that before. I might have to try that now. Good thought. What do you think about that? Topping wise, what do you put on your pizza? Anything and everything. Anything and everything except pineapple. Thank God you said that. I'm not crazy about pineapple, but anything and everything. I can do anchovies down the list. You name it, I can do it. I was going to ask you, would you put that on there? I put anchovies on when I make them at home, yeah. Not all the time, but whenever, yeah, I pop a can and put some anchovies on there. Yeah. I got no problem with pineapple on pizza. Yeah, it's all right. It's got to come a, from if pizza. It's a dessert, if it's a dessert pizza, I'm totally good with it. But like, do you mix that with like a pepperoni and pineapple? Yeah, yes. or like a ham, like go ham and pepperoni or ham and pineapple. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd do that. Like, yeah. like if Absolutely. it's like a Pizza Hut one, I'll, I'll take pineapple on it. Pizza has pretty good pineapple pizza. I'll take that. Will you go to like, will you go to the supermarket and buy a pineapple, core a pineapple, and eat a pineapple? Uh, my wife does that. She does do yes. that. Yes. And you'll, yeah, you'll she's take very consistent. And I'll take that. I don't, I don't like the work that's involved in that. No, that's, that's not hard. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it's not hard. It's a lot of work. I'd prefer it already be cut in chunks, and then I can just get well, the ease of but eating it in the chunks. Does she have one of those things where she just squirts? No, no, she doesn't do that. I think she well, just she take out like a machete. Just, she, yeah, she's slicing that thing. Yeah, very long your vein. That's what you do. Oh no, I got a mach I got a thing. Oh, you like got a the cork screw. <laughs> goes right through the rind, and then you go. Oh, see, I would have had you for just a big machete. Oh no, a big long knife out, sharpen it. Sharpen it. Like, it's, like fruit, it's like fruit ninja. I, it's like fruit ninja. I tell you what, no, I don't do that with pineapple, but I do do that. This is my second year with watermelon. Ooh. I get a machete or a large kitchen knife. It's probably every bit. I mean, it's it's a big one. Now you take the watermelon and you stand it up like you're holding like, like, a, like football. a football. Like you a got football. A, you're like a finger at the top. Yeah. Yeah. it off. First thing you do is you cut off each end, make it so it can stand up. Now it's flat on the counter. Take a big knife, and you cut the skin in the orbit of the thing, and you come off with a piece like about that big and yeah. about that, and yeah. you skin the pineapple or yeah. the, the, the watermelon, and now you just have a big red watermelon. And then you slice that up. You slice yeah. that up. Okay. That was really good. I did that yesterday, as a matter of fact, and you know, you hit about three good watermelons a summer, if you're lucky. Like, if you can get three watermelons that taste like sugar that are, like, really good, that's a good summer. I'm at two right now because yesterday's was really good, too. So you're out of the gate pretty quickly because there's, there's quite a bit of summer left. And then I get – you're right. And then I get a – what do you call that? Like, I, I just sit there and I eat watermelon. Like, a human should not be able to eat as much watermelon as I eat. I just sit there like – like, like pigs or something, like they can just like eat until they blow up or something. That's why I'm. That's like, what you do with watermelon. I just sit there and like, and just like crush the whole thing. I go, oh my god, I just ate a watermelon. What was that noise like, again? Keep it like in a Tupperware dish. Yeah, it doesn't just last. take the whole dish out there, just sit down, put it right on your lap, and just keep just crush it. it. Yeah, just crush it. That's interesting. See my see, I would have. I'll be very impatient with that. There's no way I would be doing what you'd be doing with that with that watermelon. No way. What's your level of impatience? What would you do with it? Just cut it. Or you just go to Kroger and just go buy it since it's already cut. I, I do that, and I eat it. So you're going to go buy a pre-cut watermelon? Yeah. And you don't know when they cut it. So no. it's been sitting there in that saran wrap like five or six overnights, getting that moisture on there, and it starts to get that little brownish at the top. And well, it, it is up. less labor-intensive, though. Yeah, I understand. It's not as good. No. Not as good. It's about quality. Well, me and knives don't go hand-in-hand, hand, okay. so. No pun intended. No, not at all. But, um. Uh, so yeah, so I think another thing as well is um, portion portion sizes, and I'll tell you what you'll like this. So do you remember the first time I ever I, I went over to your house for dinner 
it was the week before you and your wife went to went uh, over to Europe for, to Italy, I believe. Was this before or after he ruined his upstairs? We'll get to that story here in a second. <clears throat> but anyway, so I'm at his house. Makes a lot of pasta, a lot of pasta, some bread. Great, great meal, great meal. I'm not just saying that. I'm, I'm just saying it because I'm a big pasta guy. And I eat about two plates, okay? I walk out of there eating five plates. He's, he's consistently handing me a plate. He had five plates. He ate a lot. I was impressed. Because he kept, he kept giving them to me. And, you know, me, I'm just like, well, I, that's very disrespectful if I don't eat that. Very disrespectful. So I ate five plates worth. I had a lot of bread. Walked out of there <laughs> going back and forth. Have to slide in sideways through the door. Didn't feel well? No. Went home. Did not feel well. Went straight to bed. <laughs> went straight to bed. Couldn't deal with it. Yeah. So then, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'm glad you brought up that story because I I've been I've been wanting to uh, bring this up, you know, since I am the. Are you sure? You yes. want to bring this up? No, I am because there's a there's a there's a part. This that, might not go well. There's a part in that there's a part in that story that he's forgetting. This isn't going to go well. But this is going towards me, not you towards him. You head him off here. I don't think this is going to go well for him. No, no. Trust me. This is no. Trust me. He's got he's got the majority of the story correct. I will say that. The one thing that he's leaving out is the fact that he had called me when he first got home. I had went upstairs because you were hosting Sportsline that night, the evening Sportsline, and he, you, got, you were the host, and I had to go upstairs. I come back downstairs. I get a FaceTime call from him, and he's like, hey, uh, did you hear any dripping in the house? I said, uh, like at this point, I'm, I'm just like, my knees are knocking. I'm like, uh, no. And he's like, well, uh, I'm upstairs here and there's dripping from my ceiling. And I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah. So he's like, do you not see all this water on the floor? I'm like, uh, yeah, I see that. I go throughout sports sign. I did a good job of holding this in. I was scared. I was scared to death. I was scared to death. I'm doing sports line. My hands are shaking as if, about, as if I'm about ready to skydive. And they were shaking because you were in charge of keeping his house intact and you had failed but at as this you, point. But, Thank as, you, but, as, but as you said on the Three Guys episode with Dan Stratford, you said, and he noted as well, that I was not allowed to go upstairs. So what I did was I would go to work. I would come home. I would usually get lunch. I would usually pick up lunch on my way back, go downstairs, and that's it. Wouldn't deal with it in the middle part of the house or at the top. I never went upstairs one time. Hand on the Bible, never did that. So anyways, I get back to his house. Panhandle is there. Panhandle is there already starting. Official restoration company of the Mountaineers. <laughs> already starting cleanup and everything. I get inside. Joan greets me at the door. She's like, it's not good. I'm like, oh boy. So I go down, I sit, I sit down at the couch and, you know, he, he, eventually he comes downstairs and he just looks at me and he's just like, just keeps going. And I'm like, crap. So he hired you to house sit. Yes. While you were house sitting. Yes. His house developed a leak and it caved in the entire upstairs. Yes. And you did not know that was happening in the house you were staying in. Hand on the Bible, not one time did I hear one drip. Do you think it's reasonable to think maybe one of the duties, other duties as a sign, sometimes that's called, when you're watching the house, that maybe the one thing would be make sure it doesn't flood? Would that, would that be in the basic job description of really, house sitting or not really? really no, good, no, that's really a good, good point. No, that's a good point. No, I'll give you that. That's a good point. Yeah. But as the homeowner said to the house sitter, don't go jacking around upstairs. Don't go touching my stuff. Just don't do any of that. Only because you're creepy. Okay, but let me ask it a different way. No, man. that's not it. I, no, that's called. If you were there to house sit, okay, and you didn't notice and or react when the upstairs was caving in, what exactly were you there to do? Thank if, you, Brad. If not that, take care of what Charlie. What would have been your primary duty there while house sitting? Take care of Charlie. Water the plants. Mow the lawn and everything else. And if the house falls down around you. But here's the point though. But, here, but here's what I'm trying Charlie's to. Charlie's fed. Yeah. Hey, Charlie's dog's fed. That plant over there did not go down. Your whole upstairs is wrecked. Might Charlie's need to build okay. A new house. The plant and Charlie are good. Yeah, Charlie's okay. Sorry about the rest of the house. Yeah. Did now, a hell of a job. I will say this though. I will say this. You did say not to go upstairs and I did not go upstairs. And like I just mentioned, I did not proceed to go upstairs, so what I would do, I'd get, I'd get my stuff and go downstairs. Do you, a, think possibly, do you think possibly that when I said, hey, 
don't go jacking around upstairs that it might be me just like doing what I always do to you, like jacking around with you. You were pretty serious whenever you said this, though. Senator? Do you always follow everything we say 100%? Yes. Untrue. Untrue. Okay, but, but, like some, but like something Why, like wait, this. I mean, that's 100% that you, untrue. When you host a podcast, you get to lie if you're the host. Is that what you do now? That's just untrue. I mean, how many times have we told okay, you? I'll, let me, so let if me, there would have ever been an exception to listening to what someone said, it would have been when you were hearing dripping. Yeah. Thank you. But, but would you, not, but we, but would you not hear wait, the drip? Wait, I have a question. Drip. When you, when you pulled the blinds down, the drapes in his room, when you pulled those off the wall and caused damage, was that downstairs or on the main living area? Where was that? Downstairs. I will say this, though. That was where? Downstairs where I was, where I was sleeping, in the guest bedroom. You yanked the curtains I, off. You yanked the rods accident, off. On accident. On accident. On accident. That's what my son Andrew used to say when he was three. Okay. When something bad happened. But it was on accident. It was on accident. So here's the, so I'll, I will say this, I will say this. I might have crapped myself that next morning because I actually drove around Morgantown. You can ask Andrew this, not Andrew, you can ask Matthew this. I drove around People Morgantown. People don't have any idea who Matthew is. Matthew Caridi, son of Tony Caridi. Okay. I drove around Morgantown. I went to Suncrest. I went to Saberton. I went to any possible Target, Walmart, Walgreens, Kroger, wherever I could possibly find something remotely close to that, I would go to that place, try and find it, couldn't find it. I called, I called Matt and I said, dude, I'm screwed. Your dad legitimately might kill me. This was, let me remind you, this was two days, two days before you had come home and there was drippage upstairs. So, and by the way, I'm not going to bring this up, but it was an accident because uh, the fact that there was a cramp and I, it was three o'clock in the morning. So that's, that's my stance on that. I'm not sure your defense of either worked. I really struggled. I'm simply it. explaining both struggled. sides of it. Yep. I'm, I'm explaining it. That's all I'm doing. Yeah, I struggled. Sorry. But I, but I am giving my side of the story since people were probably, because I, I did, whenever, he, whenever that story was told, I had at least five people come up to me and ask me if I did $17,000 worth of damage to his house. And it's a simple answer. Yes. No. Yes. No. <clears throat> okay. Well, what'd you guys think of this episode? It was a good best weird... one I've ever been on. What about you, Brad? Not even close. Yeah. Best one I've ever Is been on. Is that it? Yeah. We're, it's over? We've got an hour 13. What about a sponsor? You got, how do you sell this thing? How do you monetize this? I'm, like I told you in the beginning, I don't have any sponsors. I'm working on it. And I've consistently pushed it out. Like Brad said in the beginning, you continue to push content push out. Push content. And you continue to push. Put, thought he'd give you. Just hit singles. Just hit singles every day. If you just hit singles, you'll be all right. Don't need to Derek hit home Jeter. Run. Derek Jeter. Yeah, exactly. You want us to get you a sponsor? I mean, what can we do for you? I mean, if you want to give me a sponsor, I would love a sponsor. Hey, folks. What's the name of this podcast? Hoops Across the Mountain State. Hey, folks. Tony Caridi for Hoops Across the Mountain State. If you have a home sitter who does irreparable damage to your home, anything in the fifteen to one hundred thousand dollar damage range, then call Taylor Kennedy if you need that done. He'll sit in your house as it burns. He'll sit in your house as the roof collapses. He'll sit in your house as the electric fire begins and the water boils off the floor and your hot water tank implodes, and he will watch it all happen. And then you can make the call to the restoration company of Hoops Across the Mountain State. On behalf of Taylor, thanks for listening to episode 50 of Hoops Across the Mountain State. You know what he is? He's like that insurance company dude. That like the, the thing explodes and he comes out and he's all, that's him. May mayhem. He's mayhem. That's what he is. He's mayhem. There's your new name, dude. You're mayhem. Ripping curtains off my house. $17,000 of damage. Furnace comes through the attic floor. Plant stayed alive, though. Plant stayed alive, and the dog was fine. Doesn't have a house to live in anymore, but he's fine. Thanks, Taylor. We appreciate you having us on. I appreciate you guys being on, Enjoy even it. though even though we, we went come down. back on for episode 500. We want 500. How about 100? Nah, 500 is good. <laughs> I think I I'm busy for 100. <laughs> 500 will be better. I'll be busy for 100 as Thank well. You. Okay.
All right, thank you guys for listening to episode 50, the one-year anniversary of Hoops Across the Mountain State, again with our guests Brad Howe and Tony Caridi of Metro News. And we will catch you next time on episode 51 next week. Thank you all for listening.